Yeah, not as bad as me. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to get uh, started. All right. And these introductions correct. Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Wendy Schiller, and I am a professor of political science and international and public uh, relations. And I am uh, public relations, public affairs, <laughs> public relations. I'm just thinking, how do I, how do I spruce this up? Um, and I am very fortunate to be colleagues with our um, uh, author of the day, Eric Potashnik, and we're here for what should be a really fascinating discussion of his book, Counter Mobilization, Policy Feedback and Backlash in a Polarized Age. Um, we have what I would, uh, I would describe as a rock star <laughs> panel um, spanning uh, political disciplines of political science and public policy. Um, so it's a, a rare event to have all of these uh, amazing scholars in the room together. So we are just really fortunate. It would take the whole time for me to do a proper induction, uh, introduction. So I am going to start with Eric Potashnik, who is the Julius Rabinowitz uh, Professor of Political Pol P Public Policy and Political Science and Chair of the Political Science Department. Um, he is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Uh, he previously held faculty positions at the University of Virginia, UCLA, and Yale University. He has several other books in addition to his current book. Um, he's the co-author of, of Unhealthy Politics, The Battle Over Evidence Medicine from Princeton University Press, um, The Dynamics of American um, Pol Democracy, which we uh, co-edited, Congress and Policymaking in the 21st Century, co-edited with Jeff Jenkins, Cambridge Press, Living Legislation, Durability, Change, and Politics of American Lawmaking, also with Jeff Jenkins, University of Chicago Press, Promoting the General Welfare, New Perspectives on Government Performance, also Brookings Institution Press, co-authored with Alan Gerber, Putting Trust in the U.S. Budget, Federal Trust Funds and the Politics of Commitment, Cambridge Press, and also the co-author with Gene Bardak of the seventh edition, and I think soon to be the sole author, right, of this book? No? Nope, not. Okay. <laughs> A Practical Guide for Policy Analysis, the, eight, the Eighth Fold Path to More Effective Problem Solving from CQ Press 2023. So that's our um, author, uh, and we have our panel. Uh, I'll do in the order of presentation today. Andrea Louise Campbell is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and Director of Undergraduate Studies at MIT, also the former chair of that department. She's the author of Policy Feedback, How Policies Shape Politics, with Daniel Blon and R. Kent Weaver, Trapped in America's Safety Net, One Family Struggle, um, with University of Chicago Press, The Delegated Welfare State, Medicare Markets and the Governance of Social Provision with Kimberly Morgan, Oxford 2011, Oxford Press, and How Policies Makes Citizens, Senior Citizen Activism and the American Welfare State, Princeton. And she's got a next book, a fifth book, tentatively titled How Americans Think About Taxes, Scheduled Publication. She has published in all of the very top journals in the profession. We're very happy to have her here. We also have Professor David Mayhew of Yale University, who I would say is uh, the greatest scholar of Congress that has ever lived and is, continues to live, <laughs> which we're very, very happy about. Um, Sterling Professor Emeritus of Political Science, Professor Emeritus Institute of Social and Policy Studies at Yale. Um, 
there is nobody who knows more about policymaking in Congress than David Mayhew, so we are just thrilled to have him here. His official biography is way too long to read, um, but he retired from Yale in 2015, still teaches courses. He specializes in U.S. legislative behavior, political parties, and policymaking. He has many, many books. I'm just going to name a few. Um, the Imprint of Congress, 2017, Partisan <coughs> Balance, Parties and Policies, Electoral Realignments, America's Congress, Divided We Govern, hmm. Placing Parties in American Politics. That book was published in 1986 and is <coughs> still extraordinarily relevant to American politics today. Congress, The Electoral Connection, um, which was his second book shortly after graduate school, but one of his most famous, <coughs> and Party Loyalty Among Congressmen. So we are thrilled to have him here at Brown today in conversation. And um, uh, last but never least, we have Professor James Marone, our own, John Hazen White Professor of Public Policy, Professor of Political Science and Urban Studies. Um, he received his PhD in the University of Chicago, and he is now completing his 46th second year at Brown University. Um, he has been the chair of the department, political science department. He was the head of the Taubman Center. He's now co-director co of the Stone Inequality Initiative. His first book, this is every graduate student's dream, the first book that he wrote and published, The Democratic Wish, won the American Political Science Association's Gladys Kammerer Award for the best book on U.S. national policy. His, he has published a number of subsequent books. Um, uh, his Hellfire Nation, The Politics of Sin in American History, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he has uh, also published a book, The Heart of Power, Health and Politics in the Oval Office, co-authored with David Blumenthal of Harvard University. And his, um, mm -hmm. not, it, one of his more recent books, 2020, is Republic of Wrath, How American Politics Turned Tribal, From George Washington to Donald Trump. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and he's been on the editorial board of 13 journals and editor of two of those. He's also been president of the New England Political Science Association um, and the Politics and History section of the American Political Science Association and has succeeded in raising millions of dollars for Brown and has been um, and continues to be one of Brown's most lauded and most popular professors for pretty much since the minute he got here. I wasn't here, people told me. Um, uh, and to all of us, he has been an extraordinary mentor for research and teaching. So we're thrilled that he's on the panel. So without further ado, we are going to get started. I will warn the panelists that I am a fairly strict timekeeper. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. And thanks so much for everyone for coming. It really is uh, a lot of fun and a thrill to be here with some of my favorite political scientists, and it's uh, really an honor to have them on the panel. And also, I want to call out a almost a very happy 87th birthday to David Mayhew. So congratulations, David. So what I'm going to try to do is give you um, uh, quickly uh, an overview of this book project. Uh, and um, give you a sense of what it's about and its theme. So this is a book about backlash politics in the American state, essentially since the 1960s. Why do we want to study backlash? Well, part of the reason is that backlashes have really been at the center of our ever more conflictual politics in recent decades. Some of the most prominent episodes, the uh, labor union backlash against NAFTA, of course, the long struggle against Obamacare, uh, the cap and trade bill, you may recall, from the Obama administration, which didn't pass. Uh, under Trump, migrant family separations led to some of the largest protests in uh, modern American history. During the COVID pandemic, we had a lot of uh, counter-mobilization and grassroots protests against lockdowns and other restrictions uh, imposed by governors and public health agencies. And of course, as we speak, we are in the midst of an ongoing backlash to the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs. So, trying to understand the events of American history, some of the most important events have involved ordinary citizens and interest groups mobilizing against policy changes. Um, so what is policy backlash? Well, there's a large literature on backlash, and there's basically two main strands. One of them, and the first one is probably the one you think about most intuitively, and that is that many scholars define backlash as an intrinsically conservative or reactionary response to liberal social change. Very large and important literature on white backlash. Um, 
Other social scientists, and here I'm building on work by Mansbridge and colleagues, and more recently, uh, Alter and Zern, recognize empirically that most backlash activity has come from the right, but argue that the backlash phenomenon cannot be reduced to conservative resentment, that it's a wider phenomenon. And so in this book project, I'm adopting a neutral definition of backlash to permit analysis of a wide range of cases. And these include both very prominent events, like the ones I mentioned, as well as some long forgotten episodes that I think are quite interesting. Probably my favorite little instance in, the, in all my research, some of you that are a little bit older will remember, when the federal government in 1973, in an effort to promote automobile safety, passed a regulation that required the drivers of a car and then also the uh, front passenger to buckle up their seatbelt or else the car would not start. The American public did not like this. <laughs> so, and of course, there was a tremendous backlash against this, and Congress ultimately um, ended up uh, eliminating that regulation. In the book, what I'm doing is I analyze backlash through the lens, the literature on policy feedback. Many political scientists know there's been a large and interesting literature that's developed about how policies are not only the outcomes of politics, which of course they are, but how they also shape subsequent political contestation by producing incentives and resources for political actors, including both organized groups and mass publics. Now, of course, we know from the important work of Andrea uh, and people like Suzanne Mettler that sometimes policies can create positive feedback and build supportive coalitions. Policy backlashes, though, occur when a change or an attempted change in the status quo stimulates widely noticed resistance among mass publics or organized groups. And so these backlash events that I'm talking about, they're unfolding in what David has written about so insightfully in what he calls the public sphere. These are parts of the politics that we see. This is not all that's important in politics. There's a lot of resistance to change that happens below the radar. Certainly think that's important. But what happens in the public sphere is quite consequential. And that's what this is about. Now, backlash um, is not a new phenomenon in the United States. Go back to the early re republic and the backlash against the Alien Sedition Act. We can think of the public's thumbs down reaction to FDR's effort to pack the courts and uh, after Reconstruction, of course, the most tragic era of backlash in our, uh, in our nation's history. But I argue that it's become a more common pattern in the US due to three interlocking developments. The first is the increase in polarization and the rise of team-oriented politics, uh, a polarized, uh, context creates very strong incentives for party leaders to mobilize against the policies of their opposition as a, as a way of both rallying their bases and uh, directing attention away from fissures within their own coalitions. In addition, growing racial and social diversity, as well as cultural shifts that have threatened the worldview of people with traditionalist values. America has changed tremendously over the last half century. Public opinion has moved left on many issues, gay marriage, egalitarian gender roles. Many Americans have accepted these changes, but there's a segment of the population that has felt uncomfortable and alienated by them. And then third, and I think quite importantly, there's been a tremendous broadening of the scope of federal activity over the last six decades. Great work by Brian Jones and colleagues in their book, The Great Broadening. The interest group system in Washington has been transformed. As government has grown, it has not only built supportive coalitions, who of course can counter mobilize if their benefits are threatened, but it's also antagonized other actors that view government as imposing costs or threatening um, things that they hold dear. And so big government itself has been part of the story of backlash. What I try to do in the book is develop a framework for understanding the conditions under which particular policy moves are more or less likely to trigger adverse reactions. To be sure, there's some degree of contingency in politics, but I argue that backlash is not a random event. This is not, when it happens, it's not like lightning striking you out of a clear a blue sky, it's more like a rocket crashing because of design flaws. And so I develop a framework that is, focuses on both the motives for backlash, the means of counter-mobilization, and then the political opportunity structure, and look at how those three variables interact to create high probability of backlash. Under motives, these are particular attributes of policies that, that impose costs or threats on particular constituencies that give them an incentive to resist change. These include things like concentrated costs, salient general costs, threats to the status of people reliant on existing arrangements, failures to represent the preferences and priorities of voters, 
and then the perception that government is providing benefits to some groups socially constructed as undeserving. Um, but backlash, again, is not automatic. Just because a constituency bears a cost or is threatened doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be able to counter-mobilize. To be active in politics takes resources. It takes money. It takes information. All groups don't have them in equal measure. And so we also have to look at the internal capacities for civic participation and engagement of loss-bearing or threatened groups. One of, I think, the important implications here is that other things equal, more privileged groups are going to be able to engage in counter-mobilization activity more easily than more marginalized groups, even if marginalized groups are bearing the cost of change. And then finally, the political opportunity structure, drawing on work on social movements from Sid Taro, whether the loss-bearing group is able to find allies in its external network, whether elites are all agree about the need for the change, or whether they're divided, will also shape the probability of backlash. So in the book, I use two main research methods to try to understand this phenomenon. The first one is an analysis of media-identified backlashes. Uh, with the help of some amazing uh, Brown University RAs, I uh, developed and coded a database of uh, nearly 2,000 New York Times article discussing backlash episodes in a policy context since the 1960s, and tried to code them in a variety of ways. When did it happen, in what policy arenas, who participated, what type, what was the direction, was the backlash anticipated, or was it materialized? We can talk more about it. The database has limitations, but I think it captures most of the important events that we think about, including the civil rights backlash in the 60s, consumer backlash against managed care, labor union backlash against NAFTA, uh, more recently backlashes against the ACA, family separation, and so on. So this is what the data series looks like. Um, the five high count years, the, the two highest were in the 1960s, as you would expect. Um, but what I think was quite striking was that the 2010s emerges as a period of very high contestations. Uh, I wouldn't put quite as much faith in the actual you know, number of articles per year, but the overall pattern I think is interesting, and what's especially striking is the diffusion of backlash events across policy areas over time. So in the 1960s, a period of very, very high backlash activity, backlash was largely concentrated in the civil rights arena. But as we go forward in time, the 80s and into the 2010s, we see civil rights remains a very important arena, but we also see it in health, in immigration, in trade, and other areas. In the, in, in the book, I use some statistical count analysis to try to look at some of the correlates of what's associated with these events. And the big takeaway is one of them is polarization. It appears to have been an accelerant controlling for a variety of other factors. Um, I coded the ideolo ideological direction of the backlash. As you would expect, most backlashes come from the right. Uh, and more than twice as many articles I coded were instances of conservative backlash. But what's interesting is that liberal backlash has been growing. As we have seen liberal past achievements threatened as Republicans have gained power and have moved to the right, we are increasingly seeing environmentalists, civil rights groups, and others counter-mobilizing against change and threatened change. The second approach I use in the book is a series of detailed case studies to get a real feel for how this plays out in the ground. I look at areas like healthcare, immigration, trade, anti-globalization, right-wing backlash at the grassroots, Second Amendment sanctuaries for, against gun control, tax exemptions, the effort to withdraw them for segregated schools, the recent fights over transgender rights in the bathroom bill in North Carolina. And then I also look at cases where some of the factors that I mentioned for backlash were present, but backlashes either didn't happen or were relatively muted, try to understand those no cases. Why didn't they happen? So three of the cases I looked at were the SNL bailout in the 80s, Reagan's firing of the air traffic controllers, and then the provision of social benefits for people with drug felony convictions. So real quick, what are the key findings? Uh, yep, I'm almost done. Um, first, backlash is not an automatic response to threats or losses. We have to see motives, means, and political opportunities align, and they don't always do so, in, in part sometimes because politicians take steps to prevent them from aligning to, uh, to avoid blame. Uh, I won't go through this, but I have a, a, a matrix in the book that tries to look at how we see different kinds of outcomes depending on whether the internal and, and external incentives for counter-mobilization are strong or weak, and we can talk about that. Um, what was quite striking from the coding of the New York Times articles is that the wide variety of actors that have been involved, including uh, religious and social conservatives, environmentalists, unions, business actors were surprisingly active in backlash. Um, 
when backlash, while backlashes often fade, sometimes their impact outlasts the shocks that caused them to be unleashed in the first place. So, for example, the movement of evangelicals in alignment with the Republican Party was stimulated by a fight over tax breaks for segregated schools, and that, even though that was an issue that is faded, had durable consequences for partisan coalitions. Um, a fear of triggering backlash can constrain the menu of policy solutions and even determine which issues are put on the agenda in the first place. It can have very negative consequences. A lot of the ACA's cost control framework has been disappeared because of backlash. But sometimes backlash can facilitate learning, and we can talk about it, the movement from the failure of cap and trade to the Inflation uh, uh, Reduction Act, I would argue, was a case where backlash led to a certain kind of policy learning. So. Um, I will skip that about what actors can do if they're confronted with the possibility of backlash. The last slide is that I think the study of backlash offers us insights into how new policies create a new politics. Most of the literature on policy feedback is focused on increasing returns processes, but, we're in, but what we need to recognize is that's not automatic. Sometimes what policies do is not build support but actually engender uh, opposition. And a lot of the writing on backlash has focused on partisanship and tribalism and has not paid much attention to the content and substance of public policy itself. So I want to bring public policy back into the study of backlash. And finally, a study of backlash gives us insights into how to design reforms that can stand the test of time. So I will stop there. Thank you. We will, we will be hearing again from Professor Potashnik in response to the panelists' comments on his work. So our first uh, panelist is Professor Andrea Campbell from MIT. Um, well, great to be here uh, with Eric and with all of you. It's a tremendous book. I highly recommend it to all of you. Um, and of course, it's a continuation of the wonderful work that Eric did, especially with your firms at risk. Uh, book and, and other projects as well, that the politics of policy hardly stop at the moment of passage, right? Um, and I think here, uh, as you, uh, I think, probably could surmise from his uh, summary of the book, is that Eric, once again, tweaks those of us who work on policy feedbacks to remind us, again, that policy feedbacks are not necessarily positive or necessarily protective that uh, policies do not necessarily distribute resources or create new sets of winners who rally around policies and get them entrenched. Uh, that there are, that can be other, ki other kinds of processes that can happen post-enactment that in some cases end up tearing down these programs and getting them replaced uh, uh, with other, other sorts of uh, priorities. Um, uh, so instead, sometimes we have organized interests, especially, who having failed to block policy during the passage, you know, during debate and passage, perhaps because they didn't realize what the consequences were going to be, uh, and those consequences only became apparent after passage, uh, we have these kinds of groups coming back at it to try to attack these, these uh, kinds of policies, new policies um, after enactment. And I will say in the spirit of full disclosure, Eric and I have spent our entire careers in this little dance like, He's a reviewer on one of my books. I'm a reviewer on one of his books over and over and over again. Full disclosure, I was surprise, surprise, a reviewer on this book. Oh, um, yeah. Yay. So. <laughs> yeah, see? That's why you have these book launch parties, because like all the, the truth comes out, right? Um, so it was so great to see many of my questions addressed. Um, <laughs> you know, one of which was, is backlash, this counter-mobilization, fundamentally asymmetrical? Is it always going to be from the right? And as you see, not necessarily. It's from the right because of the expansion of the activist state, creates a lot of right targets uh, for those on the right because the, the you know, advancement of the state has been a liberal project. Um, and also because it has become a more diverse nation um, and so traditionalists are threatened, as Eric noted. Another question I had was, well, what about that whole quiet politics of business literature um, that gets so much attention in the literature, you know, why battle publicly post-enactment? And it seems that sometimes business interests really do not realize what's going to happen uh, or what the consequences are going to be. And I highly recommend Leah Stokes's book, um, Short Circuit, which uh, is about the fog of enactment. You can't necessarily know in your organized interest what the outcome is going to be until after enactment. 
Um, and political polarization means there could be s fewer penalties for fighting back in a very public way. So those are just a couple of things I brought up when I was reviewing the book. Um, but now I have additional comments that the book is, that now that the book is out. And I offer these in the spirit that I think this book is going to be agenda setting. And so these are some questions that I have that I hope future researchers taking Eric's framework can, can begin to explore because there's so much more to do in this very, very rich area. Um, and so my first question is concerning the ideological and partisan direction from which backlash comes. Um, you know, part of the argument in his book is, is sort of about as a period kind of effect. You know, when are liberals expanding the state? Therefore, we get this conservative backlash. But I'm wondering more: is it issue by issue? You know, are there is issues where fundamentally you're going to get liberal backlash, and is that set of issues different from the set of issues you're going to get conservative backlash? Um, are liberals uh, engaging in backlash against the revocation of rights? Are conservatives? engaging in backlash against the extension of benefits. You know, can we categorize issues uh, according to which side uh, is going to be uh, most engaged in, in, in trying to undermine existing policy? A second question has to do with the role of private actors. Um, you offer a number of strategies, which are quite interesting, for thwarting policy backlash. And so I want to add another to the list. Um, and that is make sure that powerful actors are going to benefit from your policy if you don't want to have a backlash reaction. So I think back to uh, the book that Kimberly Morgan and I wrote about uh, the Medicare, our, our delegated welfare state, which is about uh, Medicare reform. And it's about the increasing privatization of Medicare and the role of private actors there. And one of the arguments we make in that book is that uh, further privatizing public programs is helpful for coalition leaders, to use the Doug Arnold term, uh, helpful for coalition leaders because if you have private actors who are going to benefit from your policy design, that's you know an additional member of your coalition that's going to help you assemble the tremendous uh, sort of supermajority that you need in the U.S. to get policy enacted. Um, and so I'm wondering then, and ex as an extension of that idea, does that also then mean if you use private actors, you're going to get less backlash because you have this powerful actor that is uh, supportive of your policy because there's, there's money to be made given their role? Um, so that would be an interesting thing for future researchers to look at. Um, a third question has to do with asymmetries in who can engage in counter-mobilization and backlash. You say, page 172, that counter-mobilization depends on money, recognition, legitimacy. And so I'm wondering, well, does that mean then that backlash is a political strategy that is not available to all actors? You know, to what degree is backlash, like policymaking to begin with, dominated by privileged interests? Or could it be the case that if you employ the kinds of methods that, say, Harry Hahn uses to take low research or sorry, low resource people and make them into more effective political actors uh, who ordinarily get the short end of the stick, can you turn them into backlashers, um, especially in this coming era where I think we're going to see more and more conservative policy making and those, you know, exactly those kinds of people not faring well, but can we make them more active in politics so they can fight back? Relatedly, and my fourth question here is about the role of the public. You know, in the book, it's very interesting because a number of the actors are these kinds of elite level actors, but the public plays a not insignificant role. Uh, this is not a theory or a set of explanations only about these elite level actors, but about the mass public. And you underline the fact that policy supporters need to be vigilant uh, and watchful about who benefits, who pays, and so on. Because those who feel that their uh, new policy is going to take away benefits that they embrace, uh, or new policies are going to impose costs on them that they resent, that they become important actors and an important uh, set of impetus for these backlash processes. And so my question is, well, on what policies do members of the mass public develop their own perceptions and preferences? And on which do we need elites to lead them along? 
you know, there's a pretty prominent consistent uh, consensus in the literature on mass politics that lots of people don't pay a lot of attention to politics and policy most of the time, that public opinion and the formation of preferences is oftentimes a, a top-down kind of process. And so what are the conditions in policy areas where um, we're going to see those kinds of um, those processes? Uh, where are, under what conditions and what policy areas um, are publics able to figure out their interests directly? And in which ones are there, is it the case that the, that elites and their interests and their calculations um, are, that they use those to sort of frame messages to the public that then enable the backlash processes that the elites are trying to engender? Um, so basically, when is the public capable of making its own judgment, and when do they get led by these other forces that are hostile to the policies? Uh, fifth, and here's an area where I think graduate students, may a thousand flowers bloom, uh, should really pursue this work, and that is that uh, this book is mostly focused on national politics, but what do we expect in the states? Uh, are patterns of counter-mobilization, backlash, going to be different or similar? Will they be similar because so much of subnational politics is nationalized these days, as, as people like um, Dan Hopkins have pointed out? Or might there be less counter-mobilization with regard to state-level policymaking because states tend to be sort of one-sided politically uh, these days? Or might there be less counter-mobilization at the state level because of political and policy learning, which is to say, um, if you pass a policy in one state and there's backlash, observers in the other 49 states can be like, ah, ha, 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 we need to change our policy design when we do it in our state to avoid uh, what happened in state A, right? Um, and you can imagine this kind of political learning taking f a couple of different forms. Of course, we have now these... Um, these initiatives, these model legislation kinds of uh, initiatives. You can imagine the, the framers of model legislation being very careful about writing this legislation in a way that is least likely to uh, foment backlash. But also, in lots of arenas, you've got many bites of the apple if you've got 50 states, right? And so are proponents learning to avoid backlash and modifying their proposals uh, because they've observed what's gone on in earlier states? Excellent. I'm on my last point. Um, and so my sixth point is really, it's more of an observation, less of a question. So, um, and this is about the idea that backlash has been from the conservative direction because of this liberal project of expanding the activist state. And I'm wondering now, is this going to come to, the, to an end? But I'm now wondering, conservative policymaking is on the move. Could there be a coming wave of liberal, liberal backlash, which you suggest? Okay. But my comment is this. It's more about the fact that conservatives have, are very good at policy learning, right? And many conservatives have been engaging not just in counter-mobilization, but much more profoundly in changing the underlying rules of the game and the institutions to thwart the very possibility of counter-mobilization. So think about stacking the decks, or st stacking, stacking the courts with sympathetic judges and using the courts to undermine rights uh, in a way that's like really harder to mitigate against, right? Um, conservative legislators and states using preemption to take policymaking power away from municipalities. Uh, conservative legislators, governors undermining ballot initiatives, right, undermining the meaning of direct democracy, and of course this uh, project of undermining voting rights. So I'm just wondering if conservatives have this, um, it's not just about backlash against specific policies kind of one by one, but rather this larger project of undermining the possibility of liberal backlash. And so what does that mean for the future ideological and partisan complexion of counter-mobilization? So I will end there, and congratulations, congratulations to Eric on another wonderful book. It's so important. It's so insightful. Uh, so much food for thought. So you all should read it. Thank you. So now we have uh, Professor David Mayhew. Um, Professor Mayhew, do you want to stay seated and talk into the microphone or stand at the podium? I'm going to go up there, but I'm going to take my bag so I can put my papers on it so I can see. Okay. okay. Oops, there we are. I got it. 
Well, it's good to be here to see some old friends here on the panel and also in the audience out there, long time. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. And I want, Eric's an old friend, by the way. We were colleagues for a few years, wonderful years at, at Yale some time back. And this book, I think this book is a landmark work that he's written. I've read it very carefully twice. I see that as I think is definitive on its subject. And it's a good subject. It has, it has an excellent new data set get, uh, gleaned together by his folks, his, uh, his students out of the Times, and also from Engram. Somebody did that. It has excellent analysis. It has wonderful discussion, the case studies. It, it's an illumination of about two-thirds of a century of uh, policymaking, one way or another, going back all the way into and including the 1960s. It has, an, I think, an especially fine treatment of the Affordable, Affordable, Affordable Care Act going on for many pages, best I've seen as a kind of wrap up of what was going on there. I liked his uh, bit about uh, something called Second Amendment sanctuaries. That was entirely new to me. The story was that Virginia, the state, passed the law, some gun control law, and a lot of the sheriffs said, no, we're not going to enforce that. And uh, th that was a backlash. I mean, there was a sheriff backlash in Virginia. Never heard of that before. It's an interesting instance. I think also it's nice, Eric, to hear, to get aside from the retrenchment literature, which has had dominated discussion of many things in recent times, into an, a different kind, a different branch of effects literature, namely the backlash branch of effects literature. Now, on the book itself, I have uh, comments in uh, a number of buckets, I think in three buckets I want to uh, bring up on the book itself. One is this. I wondered somewhat about the increasingness of backlash from the 60s through today. Now, it is a sure thing that the usage of the term has increased over that time. I think it's probably true that the, that the that the reality which successfully induces the usage over time has also had an increment, so it's there. But nonetheless, uh, that, uh, that simply an increased use of the term backlash, why that has to be looked at, and Eric does that. I think actually what he said was he's up here talking about, he said about how diffusion, I think there's probably some, some truth in that. That is the the term got used very excitedly in the 1960s, and then the, it, since then, it is, it is, the usage of it has diffused. And that's, that, they, that's partly reaction to reality, but I guess partly reaction to diffusion of the use, in the usage of a term. Now, let it be said that terms have consequences. That is, regardless of what the causes of a term might be, the usage of a term can have consequences, and uh, the Times is always doing that. They bring up terms that think they have consequences by bringing up terms. They do that. It's a, tra it's a, you know, it's a newspaper. All right, but I did, th on the increase of this, I had a, and the, his, his engram, he has very time, time, very nice time series. One is the Times, which he flashed up there. The other is engram. Let me say I don't really know what engram is, but it seems to be very nice, and he has a very nice time <laughs> series there. It's, uh, and, uh, it, it, but the Engram time series on usage of the term in the media is basically monotonic, that it goes the 60s stemming right through today, and that's consistent with, again, with reality, but also with usage. I have a feeling that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, some stuff missing in the journalist's usage application of the term back at those earlier times, the 60s and the 70s, and particularly the 80s. For example, I didn't say anything there about reaction to the school prayer decision that the Supreme Court came down with, or to maximum feasible participation, which was a big thing in the middle 1960s, you may remember, or maybe to the military draft. That is, all those executive decisions, which are certainly reacted to, I remember it well, why weren't they talked about as backlash? The, that is the reactions of the students to that. Why was why wasn't that labeled to be back? These are executive decisions, and on the, on Eric's list, there's a lot of executive decisions, as with Patco, for example, under um, under uh, or public housing. You remember public housing? They had a succession of statues over time, building all those houses, and then they dynamited them. You remember those St. Louis houses, big developments being dynamited, whenever it was, and then they took down the ones. In Chicago, was that backlash? Could it have been talked about as backlash? Or gas rationing under Carter, which there was there, or 
there was something called the Sagebrush Rebellion back around 1980 or so. Remember that? There's the Bork, dom the Bork domination. There was also, for that matter, the, the Crime Control Act of 1968 under, uh, under Johnson. Uh, not that he was a great advocate of the thing. It was the Crime Control Act of 1968. That's been written now out, after all, as an important invitation to the carceral state. I mean, the writing about the carceral state it's a writing about, in a sense, a backlash, not just the Crime Control Act of 68, but so uh, that's an, an important ingredient of it. In the case of the Times, um, they are, well, they, I think that, you know, you read that, you say, well, there's a lot of sense in what they're doing there, not, not, not a problem. But there, there can be a certain uh, idiosyncrasy or friskiness, and they really got excited, the Times did, about white backlash using the term in the 70s. And then I think in the 70s, they more or less went to sleep in using the term. There's really not much on the chart in the 70s. I think they hadn't decided at the times at that point that they, at that point, that they wanted to buy in very much to the usage of the term for other kinds of stuff. And then they gradually did buy in, and now they buy in in a great big way, which Eric documents very nicely. Also, uh, in other uh, uh, times, I, it seems to be true. As far as I can tell, what, what, what Eric puts out there, this is the case. An important ingredient of backlash was backlash to the Affordable Care Act, either when it was getting passed, it was a prospective backlash, or after it got passed, and then it's a retrospective backlash. I suppose it's during it's getting passed, it's also a backlash. Anyway, a lot of backlash. But there's virtually nothing in the data, apparently, about reaction to the Clinton's health care plan in 93, 94. I just, the Times doesn't seem to have coded the, the Clinton's health care drive as something that drew backlash. And we remember that, you remember the, the health care express caravan that barely made it to the East Coast in the summer of 1994? That seems like a bash clashy kind of thing, but apparently the Times didn't write about it that way. You know, I'm just complaining. It's, uh, I, I, I always do. <laughs> I, I like to look at data sets, and I, 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 th I think Eric quite right that the reality of the basis of it all does admit of an increment over the 60 years. But nonetheless, a part of the increment probably is an increment in usage. That's probably the case. That's bucket number one. Uh, bucket number two is this one. That is, he had, uh, it, it, I'm insp inspired, put it that way, to do this one by something from Eric's previous writing. <laughs> it's, um, the, it, he talks about at one point in this book, this book the, what, what attributes of policies are likely to induce backlash? That's one of his two things there. Another thing is whether counter-mobilization pops up. But the attributes of policies, he give, gives a long list of attributes, all of which make sense. I think, as I don't know where this goes, but I thought about it, that another attribute, in addition to the ones he got there, is a degree to which the design of a policy is smart or is a mess out there, and if it's a mess, there, you know, there, 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 there are routes to backlash there. It's a, now, I tell you, Eric got me into this because I think Eric is, I don't know a better writer on the subject of designing policies. As I'm thinking of his, uh, his book on where he talks about the design of the Highway Act of 1956, I used that in my classes under Eisenhower. That was a masterpiece of design. They had to do something which would work fiscally and stay on the books a while and work politically for a long period of time. And they worked at it quite a well and they did it very nicely. Another instance of genius would be the uh, Social Security Act in 1935, after all. But some things are not like that. I mean, recently I've been writing about the, the 18th Amendment. That's the Prohibition Amendment, That's the Volstead Act. And um, they decide, this is the opposite. It's unsmart design. There's a, you know, there's, a, there's a range there. In the 18th Amendment, they decided that to be jointly administered by the states and the federal government. That's what they did. And there was talk about that in the, in the Congress. Is that really going to work? And went out there. The result of designing, designing it that way is that pretty quick, in the early 20s, the states said, let the feds do it. And the Fed said, let the states do it. And as a result, nobody did it very well. Not that it was a good idea anyway. But you could see, now to be sure, most carry out difficulties, or probably most of them, 
uh, of laws are caused by contingencies down the line. You can't chart the future, no question about that. But there's a, there's a subcategory of matters there where you can see, at least to some degree up front, whether a design makes any sense, whether it's likely to work. And I think over this last 60 years, you could find some variation in the, in the, the smartness, put it that way, of designs as they come down. It's, a, it's another attribute, another possible attribute. Okay, so you have a couple of minutes for your third bucket. That's all I need. Okay. It's this, that... Backlash from Wendy. <laughs> Backlash from Wendy, that's what it is. I, I've, had, I've had that before. <laughs> I, think that, I think this one, uh, Eric in the book, he, he, he ends up, he says at the beginning, he's going to counsel policymakers how to make design better so that it's proof against backlash. He's there. Well, and at the end, he has a chapter where he supplies some quite interesting and plausible advice about how policymakers can act. But I had a reaction to that. It seems to me that in a Machiavellian sense, it's not comprehensive enough that why are enactments better than backlash to them? I mean, why be asymmetrical there? Why should we prize enactments over the reaction to them? Why should we do that? Why should we be training the, the enactors and not training the, 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 the backlashers? It's, mm -hmm. uh, in, in principle, what's wrong with backlash? I mean, let me see, give you some instances here. Suppose you're talking about the English designing the Stamp Act in 1765. Well, um, or suppose you're, uh, you're uh, maybe you'd be wanting to train, you'd be wanting to train, to train the people in Boston about how to react to it. Or that, you know, it's or the Fugitive Slave Act. How would you be thinking about that? You'd want to be training the people in Massachusetts to react to it, not to the people at Capitol Hill trying to put, get it onto the books. One of uh, along this line, one of uh, one of Eric's uh, pieces of advice to people passing laws to help them get greased along is. Sometimes it's a good idea to hide the costs. <laughs> I think that's terrible advice. To, it's an assault on the public interest <laughs> to advocate to politicians that they hide costs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oops, be careful. That's David Mayhew's version of dropping the mic. Okay. <laughs> so we now have um, Professor uh, Jim Marone of Brown University. Uh, thank you. What, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to read the book and to get a chance to talk about it. Uh, let me say what everybody else has said. This is a very smart book, and it's smart in, a, in an incredibly intricate way. Every time you think, well, well here's a flaw, uh, perhaps this is Andrea's review, but here's a flaw, three paragraphs or a chapter later, Eric's thought about it and lays it all systematically. I, I love that. It's almost like a very well-plotted, very well-plotted novel. Um, and the other piece of it, it's a little bit like Paul Starr's entrenchment. In fact, I think the two are uh, uh, belong on the bookshelf together. It takes a concept everybody knows, backlash. Of course, you know what it means. You've read about it. And really systematically unpacks it. So uh, I, I won't go on and on saying what a, what a terrific book it is. But it really is uh, not just terrific, but as David said, an important book. So you have to read it. And it's available outside. So OK, I've done that. A bit of selling, huh? Uh, really excellent. Let me make five points about it after that. First, I have a slightly different read uh, than David here. I think uh, Eric, having spent his whole life talking to policy analysts, making policy, is now telling them, you know, you guys have to worry about politics a little bit more. I read this book as dragging politics back into policy again and again in the book. You have these intricate, beautifully designed policies that fall apart. Um, you know, you take cap and trade. Economists all tell you if there's negative externality, someone has to pay for it. So why not create a market that, that, uh, that, uh, that essentially creates a carbon tax? And yet it gets people so aroused that in Oregon, militias drove the the legislator, legislature out of, uh, out of session uh, because they were about to pass a cap and trade. Uh, what Biden teaches us, don't do that, use carrots. Isn't that the oldest wisdom in political science? Distributive politics is easier. So I wonder if the punchline of this book, at least the, the, the punchline I kept seeing uh, 
was, yeah, 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 listen to the economists, listen to the people at the public policy schools writing their intricate policies, and then go talk to George Washington Plunkett and see what he'd do. Make <laughs> sure you balance those two. And in a real sense, I thought, this only a, a someone really steeped in policy could write such an intricate book bringing politics back into policy. So I wonder if that seems right to you, Eric, or, or whether you want to denounce that view. Second, let's get to the ACA. Imagine Obama sitting here. Here's what he'd say. My God, I followed all your advice. First, I took a bipartisan plan. If you don't know too much about health care, there was a proposal in Congress the year before by Wyden and Bennett, Republic, Democrat and Republican, uh, mandates to buy health insurance, heavily regulated insurance going in the market. Sounds familiar. It's Obamacare. Then he goes to the stakeholders and he cuts deals with pharma, with the hospitals, tried to cut a deal with insurance. It didn't make the deal, but at least it froze them for a while. Change as little as possible. He tried to let everybody keep their insurance. Benefits immediately. He let 26-year-olds within six months, 26-year-olds could stay on their, uh, on their parents' health care. Just try to sequence your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your uh, reform so that you can build out of the future. Check. Yeah, they screwed up. It was a long implementation for four years, but that was a consequence of not trying to change the insurance markets. It turns out very hard to rearrange insurance markets uh, so they don't do the nasty things they do. So what, Obama is sitting here, what do you say to him? He did, he checked all your boxes and it's still screwed up. So first, three questions for Obamacare. What do you do differently that gets past Joe Lieberman, the 60th vote in the Senate. Maybe you say, let's get, a, let's get rid of the filibuster so at least we can have some smoother policy discussions. But what do you do differently that can actually pass through Congress? Secondly, maybe Eric ought to say, yeah, Obamacare survived. He checked enough of my boxes that thanks to me, we've got a policy still in place. And third and most seriously, after years with whiplash, Eric, where are you on health care policy? I mean, I read this book and despaired of ever doing anything properly, but I wonder where you are. You're a health expert. In 2028, we, and when we have a generally new administration and they call you in, what, what would you do on health care? Third, under some conditions, Interestingly enough, backlash creates deep institutional structures. The backlashers become part of the state. Business is largely out of politics. Uh, future Justice Powell writes a memo saying, I know this sounds strange, but business must get involved in politics. It was part of the backlash that Eric uh, describes, the too much regulation. But once they got involved, it was institutionalized, the changed politics, or the Tea Party becomes a regular part of the Republican Party, but not, say, uh, Black Lives Matter or Occupy. Or for that matter, the Republican Party is itself part of a backlash against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Are there conditions under which the backlash becomes institutionalized? And if so, what are they? Fourth, is there a time limit to backlash? that just to see the boundaries of the concept, at some point, it's not a backlash anymore, it's just part of politics. So abortion is a 50-year battle. Could you still describe it as a backlash by the time the Supreme Court gets around to the Dobbs decision? Uh, or is it just part of the political, uh, the political alignment? If the Republicans really were to win big in the next election, I don't think it'll happen, but if they did, the Republican study group wants us to reconsider Medicaid and send it back to a block grant from the states. Would that be backlash or just political maneuvers? It will create a backlash, but would you? So what's the boundary of the concept? And is time possibly one of the things that creates that boundary? Fifth, and um, almost last, um, there's a kind of democratic theory in this book. And I wonder if after writing it, you think of American democracy as actually stronger than you went into the book thinking, weaker, or it's pretty much what you thought. I wonder if you'd just make a comment on your book as democratic theory and the state of American democracy um, in terms of backlash per se. Uh, 
And finally, one last point to which you don't have to answer. It's just a, a, a random point I feel like making. I really give great cheers to Eric for wrestling with the racial component of backlash. And he makes the very good point that it's, it's not just race. There's lots of other backlashes, but race seems to be all over it. Um, when Barack Obama was first confronting tea parties, Jim Messina, one of his... Um, one of his advisors turned to him, seeing the uh, Tea Party people um, at a distance, but for the first time, and he says, are you okay to Obama? And Obama muses, according to Messina, they just figured out I'm black. There's a politics of the ACA, and there's a politics of race, and it's very hard to disentangle. But let me just say something about, far beyond the scope of this book, about the racial context. In the 1940s, the, both parties were divided between very liberal and very conservative branches. And the liberal branch kept the backlash from happening against the New Deal, the liberal branch of the Republican Party. The conservative branch of the Republican Party had this long set of debates in Life magazine, in, uh, in all kinds of uh, conferences. Should we ally with the conservatives in the Democratic Party, conservatives in the Republican Party, and conservatives in the Democratic Party? After all, we are the coalition that stopped Truman's big socialist ideas. Well, the debate goes on with liberal Republicans saying, no, 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 this would violate the very concept of a Republican Party until civil rights comes along. And then the Southern Democrats say, yeah, we like this coalition and go into the Republican Party chasing the liberal Republicans, Republicans away. But notice what each uh, branch brought to the, to the coalition. The very conservative Republicans hated the New Deal. They were anti-government. And the Southern Democrats hated civil rights. They were racial. And they put the two biggest fights of the 20th century into one party. We don't like government, and we don't like civil rights. And that, I think, is a deep background for why so much of our politics looks racialized, that when we hate government programs, we're often reflecting one half of this coalition that is a civil rights slash we hate government coalition. Well, that's my say. And I've got to say, again, this is really a terrific book. You learn an enormous amount from reading it. And kudos to Eric for wrestling with the really hard questions, like race, in this concept we all think we know, but is far more complicated and deep and historical, as Eric shows us. Thank you. So we're going to give... Um uh, we're going to give uh, Professor Potashnik some time to respond. Uh, I think he's probably best to stand up and respond. Um, and uh, I'm going to add just one question to the number of fantastic questions, which is um, what constitutes an effective backlash? So that's, you don't have to answer that tonight, but that's just, um, so, and so okay. go for it. Yeah, so first of all, thank you to the, uh, my great colleagues and friends for these amazingly thoughtful, thought-provoking questions. I certainly won't be able to address all of them, but I will think hard about them in the, in the coming days. Let me just make a few quick comments. First of all, unsurprisingly, uh, David Mayhew has pointed to the part of the argument that I feel less certain about, and that's the increasingness. That is the, the claim that I think is hardest to document. I think it's probably correct, but I don't think the database is fully satisfactory for that. I think the database is did achieve my goal of demonstrating that backlash is a much more fundamental pattern in American politics, more ubiquitous, more important, more widespread than, it's, than has been seen before. And I thought the database was useful for helping me understand the wide variety of actors that are involved in it. Some of them were quite surprising to me. And I, I thank Andrea, who I did not know was a reviewer, on thinking about business, for example. Um, because a lot of my expectations as well had been, well, business is going to nip policies in the bud. You know, why do they want to drag their conflicts into the noisy, contentious, uncertain public sphere. Why do that if they're so powerful? And part of the answer could be the fog of enactment, as Leah Stokes has written, but part of it is also, as Mark Smith has written, that sometimes in the American political system, business has needed public opinion on their side to accomplish their goals. And so backlashes can, even though they're risky, even though they're in the public sphere, they've needed that. And so looking at the strategic incentives of even corporate elites to engage in backlash politics, I think, has, has been important. Um, the 
I also think, you know, David, David is right about, well, you know, why, why are we trying to prevent backlash? I think I, I cheated in that mm -hmm. section of the book. I said, well, suppose the policy was good, <laughs> and then what would you do if you were an advocate, a policymaker, an organizer to try to blunt it? But of course, you know, we are faced increasingly, and this touches perhaps on Jim's democratic theory -ish question about, you know, in some of the threats to democracy, threats to core programs, well, we may depend for democratic accountability on the capacity for backlash to occur. And as I think about the prospects of a second Trump administration, for example, there are some policy moves that I think have happened. I'm quite confident the American people would rise up against it and, and, and the political system I think still has enough play would be very effective. But there's other kinds of moves that because of their policy attributes and the nature of the affected constituency, I'm much less confident. So how confident am I, for example, if Trump were to decimate the civil service through the Schedule F that would really have a negative impact on activist government, that we would see a really strong grassroots counter-mobilization like we did with Trump's family, you know, migrant family separations. I have no confidence at all, right? And so there could be highly consequential changes changes that because they are hard for ordinary Americans to understand, the, tar the constituency is too diffuse, a variety of other factors, it's going to be really difficult. And so as we look for the prospects of democracy going forward, interestingly, the capacity for backlash is very important. Um, another issue that was raised was the, you know, are conservatives better than, than liberals? I'm not sure. I think that they've been historically, broadly speaking, on the losing end of the overall project of the activist state, and so they had strong incentives to get their act together. And what, what I was, I think was striking was two kinds of phenomenon I saw in, in my case analysis. One, which um, Andrea touched on, was we are seeing now efforts by conservatives to make backlash more difficult, to, for example, you know, make it for an abortion uh, ballot initiative to require 60% to pass rather than 50%. That's, you know, playing with the rules of democracy to kind of, you know, uh, game the system, and we are seeing that. But what we also saw, what I also saw in some of the cases that I think was quite interesting was there was a period when conservatives were on the losing end from their perspective of what government was doing. They were not happy with it, and they couldn't do much about it. So for example, when conservatives were losing a lot of cases in the Supreme Court in the 1960s and 1970s, they wanted to counter-mobilize. Uh, they had external support from conservative office holders, but they didn't have the internal capacity to do much about it. So as Steve Tellis has written about, for example, they had to build the Federalist Society. That was a, a long-term project. And so for the capacity that we see today for conservatives to control the agenda, that was an, a long, long time coming. And, and conservatives you know, had to invest in those organization building in the same, same way progressives, liberals, may have to be doing some of that uh, as well. Let me see if I can just pick up on um, anything else. Um, Oh, health reform. I won't mention on Jim's health reform, but more broadly, social policy. So one of the kinds of pieces of advice that I do suggest for consideration that I think some of it is aimed at progressives that want a more redistributive, more robust state is actually trying to entrench your programs and build a durable constituency before you increase the progressivity of benefits. That was one of the models that we used to make Social Security so durable. So, you know, Social Security gives more benefits to low income, uh, to low income workers, but that increased over time relative to, to the program's origins. If you went back to where the program was in the beginning, it was less favorable. And so the program, program designers said, we're going to make this program popular. We're going to make it bipartisan. We're going to really build a strong constituency. And then once they had that in place, then they made it more redistributive. And so I think you could see that in contemporary examples like the failure of the child care a tax credit expansion to stick, more strategic thinking about coalition building, build that constituency. And then once entr it's entrenched and it's very solid, you may be able to do more. So let me stop there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So we're happy to take questions from the audience. Oh, we do have mics. Do we have mics somewhere? Or oh. okay. Who wants to go first? First question. Okay. Um, I have a question about the the way you define threats. Threats yep. and costs, yep. um, and also relatedly, if there's such a thing as pseudo backlash. And I guess what I'm thinking is, so so the idea here is that a, a policy 
threatens certain groups with in, by impo potentially imposing costs, and then they mobilize against, counter mobilize against the policy and, and try to get other allies to do so as well. But I'm thinking, like, in the context of the a ACA, um, some of those threats were totally fabricated, like death panels mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the socialist takeover of the economy. And, and, and the reason I asked about the pseudo backlash is I was thinking maybe it's not so, sometimes maybe it's not so much that groups are organizing in response to perceived threats, but like Republicans are, see potential advan political advantages yeah. if they fabricate these threats. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a great question. You touched on a couple of things. Um, the role of elites and masses, I think, was, was mentioned. Um, so f a few points. First of all, um, I do stress that these are perceived costs and threats, and people may be mistaken. But uh, in the case of the ACA, for example, one of the areas was a lot of senior citizens believed that even though the ACA was not going to directly cut Medicare benefits, that it was going to use savings in the Medicare program that they were relying on to help pay for coverage expansions, for example. And so that was something that ordinary people believed. Um, for sure, in an era of polarization, you're going to get the, you know, the opponents are going to try to gin up a, 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 a backlash among ordinary citizens. And what I argue, this is a political process. You know, are they, are they, ordinary people find them convincing or not? It's going to depend on the issue. You know, some areas of policy, you're not going to be able to tell an ordinary citizen what to think. They're good. Gas prices are going up. They can understand that. It's a novel, complex policy. The room for elite shaping a public opinion is going to be going to be stronger. In all cases, I think, in virtually all the cases, I would I, I see backlash is both a top-down and bottom-up phenomenon. That both elites and mass publics play roles. The roles they play vary across issue areas. And for sure, elites can shape public opinion, but public, the public does have its own reactions as well. And I think it's a mistake sometimes for elites to not believe that ordinary citizens are going to have their own reactions. So, you know, you stop people from going to church during the pandemic, ordinary citizens are going to see that as a threat to something that they hold very dear. Right, we have uh, Professor Jeff Colgan. Um, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for, for all of you for helping me understand this book better, and, and most especially from, uh, from Eric for, for a great book. Um, Bob Cohen used to always say to me, you never underestimate what you can learn from your colleagues. And this is like the perfect example of that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so much. I'm, I'm trying to, I have a super nerdy question, so forgive me for this. I'm trying to think about how well you could put this, pra in this, this um, framework into practice. And so it leads to a question about how you operationalize the variables in an ex ante kind of mm -hmm. way. Uh, and in particular, you've got the three variables, right? Motive, means, and opportunities. I'm thinking about the opportunities one in particular, about how well we can predict this. And so as I, in my head, try to think about, well, in the problem of climate change and whether there will be a backlash to the Inflation Reduction Act in 2025, I think I know how I could get my hands around motives and means. And I'm struggling a little bit with opportunity. And so I wonder if you could just speak. Yeah. So the um, Inflation Reduction Act is an interesting example because I think it was a response in some ways to the failure of the cap and trade. Cap and trade, as was mentioned, was a kind of economist elegant design. And actually, that was itself in some ways an effort to reduce backlash compared to a pure carbon tax, mm -hmm. right? So cap and trade was seen as more politically acceptable. But as it turned out, fossil fuel companies counter mobilized, and as well as ordinary citizens saw the act as a, uh, would lead to higher electricity prices. And so in the inflation, uh, and that kind of stalled legislative progress in Congress for a decade. So it was highly consequential. It, we moved from a kind of policy of using some carrots, uh, uh, I mean some sticks, to some more carrots. So we still, of course, there are some interests that do want to oppose the, infla the Inflation Reduction Act. Organized groups, some of them don't like it. But I think in some ways, and Biden, you know, one of the things that he has going for him in a, in a very tough re-election is he hasn't had a policy that's mobilized the mass constituency the same way the ACA has or cap and trade. So yes, there are organized groups still want to oppose it, but the mass public, I think, um, I should just say, I know it's a sidebar, but under the Inflation Reduction Act, I just put solar panels on my house. <laughs> <laughs> and my monthly electricity bill last month 
was 86 cents. Wow. <laughs> okay. So um, now on the, what can we predict? So the, you know, I think the public generally does not see direct costs for the most part from, from this act. What you do have is the opportunity structure. It was partisan, right? So it was your elites are, um, your elites are divided about whether this change was or not. So any group, any interest group that is looking for allies is going to find some elected officials. Bipartisanship, if you can get it, which is very hard, if all elites said climate change is a very, very serious problem, Republicans said we have to do this, Democrats were on board too, you might have some groups that would not like it, but they would have a much harder time in Washington. So that partisanship, I think, is going to be a factor. And so the opportunity structure provides some uh, a positive for a backlash, but because it's avoided really direct costs to ordinary citizens, that's much weaker than it otherwise would have been. Thank you, Professor Corey Brett Schneider. And we have time after this for one more question. After that, there are books available to purchase, and you can also converse with Eric directly. Yes. Thanks for writing this, and yeah, I encourage everybody to buy it. Buy a copy. <laughs> um, and thanks to the panel. I, I wanted to follow up on the question about race. I mean the. It seems like when you do the coding and when you discuss these particular backlashes, you sort of take things at face value in the terms that they're talking about. But I wanted to come back to that worry. Um, not, I mean, partly it's about the Tea Party and the sort of theory that there is an explicit idea that it's about the Affordable Care Act or about certain economic policies that, that, that are being protested. But really, the underlying worry is Obama. And then also think about another context. So during Nixon, there's a highlighting of unrest and protests and his ads. And even though he's showing white kids right. protesting, it's a sort of proxy for black protester, black um, unrest, and in uh, uh, at the time. Um, and you know, we could kind of keep yeah. with Willie Horton's and other ones. Yeah, so yeah. How do you deal with that? I mean, yeah. Race so versus implicit. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So. Um, one is the explicit stuff, that's easy, right? And so I do show, unsurprisingly, you know, um, backlash in the civil rights movement against black Americans by far is, the, is greater than any other group. But I do discuss in, in one of the policy attributes is the perception of a group that is going to the undeserving. Even when policies are race neutral, race can play a big role in that. So the perception in the ACA was part of it and, and other cases as well. So, so um, you know, I think that does always mediate those perceptions, and, and we see that in a variety of social policy, policy areas as well. I do think that the policy itself makes a difference. For sure, you know, Obama, the fact that he was the first black American, that is going to change the context in which these debates happened. Nonetheless, I think it would be a mistake to not focus on the, on the policy. Had, for example, Obama, as part of the Affordable Care Act, said, you know, we're not just going to uh, extend health insurance to Americans, we're eliminating private health insurance. Mm -hmm. I think that would have made a big difference. I mean, the scale of the backlash, and never, the policy would never have passed. So sometimes I think there's a tendency to think because race is involved, and it very much is, that, you know, there's going to be opponents and it doesn't make a difference what you do. And I think that's wrong. There was a ferocious backlash to the ACA. Race absolutely played a role in it. But the policy itself was at least passable, barely, and survived barely, whereas a more ambitious policy in that case probably wouldn't have. Mm. And if Obama, I mean, if Biden did something like that too, even though he's a, a white president, if he were to directly threaten the health benefits of Americans, I'm quite confident that the backlash would be ferocious. So I never want to eliminate the role of race. It, it is there even when it's not explicit. But I also think the content of policies and how they're perceived matters as well. Anybody? Oh. So we have uh, Professor Diva Woodley. That will be our last question. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I haven't had a chance to um, read the book yet, but I'm very excited to do so, especially after this conversation. And this actually picks up on um, a question that um, Professor Campbell brought up uh, at the end that I want you to, if you could, address. Um, and this is about the differential effectiveness of backlash, right? Mm -hmm. So how we are to understand um, the different effects, right, in terms of political consequences, um, whether or not these backlashes are uh, become institutionally entrenched, whether or not they affect policy or campaigns, right? Because um, especially going forward, 
um, as we see more and more backlash from uh, liberals, right, or the left, um, I wonder if we're noticing differentials in the, the effectiveness of those backlash in terms of the effect on the political environment, um, whether or not policy stands and remains um, effective, whether parts of it are dismantled, um, whether or not public opinion changes over time, whether or not political coalition shift. Like, right. I'm just wondering what you're seeing or what your analysis is in terms of the effectiveness of backlash and what we can understand about that, um, uh, given the institutional context in terms of the uh, right changing the rules right. of the game, but even beyond that in terms of um, um, what kinds of staying power the complaints of certain right. members of the polity have versus others. Right. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be one of those cop-out answers by first off saying that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And it's a great question because what I try to touch on in the book but probably don't systematically code is that backlashes can matter for the full variety of outcomes that you can talk about. It can affect the sustainability and embedding of reforms. It could affect public opinion. It could affect coalition formation. It could affect the long-term prospects for policy change. There's a variety of, of different outcomes. Um, and you know, one of the limitations, for example, of, of the New York Times database is the New York Times database is showing a lot of backlash in, say, civil rights and in uh, women's rights and many other areas. That's not going to capture public opinion. Public opinion has become more liberal over time. It, 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 there's been a secular change in public opinion in many of those areas, even though there are particular social conservatives, evangelical groups that are continuing to counter-mobilize. So that was, it's not a very good database for actually capturing public opinion. Another thing that I, I do talk about is the strategies and the posture that, that actors should take with regard to backlash, if there's a threat of backlash, will depend not only on their goals, their time horizons, their values, but also what role they're playing in the political process. If your goal is simply protecting a policy or expanding a policy, you might have a different take on what you should do than if you're an advocate or an organizer that's trying to gain power for your group. For some actors, actually deliberately provoking a backlash is a way to demonstrating your credibility before particular audiences because of, you know, your opponents aren't angry, you aren't pushing hard enough. Mm. Well, that's because you're your goal is, in some ways, the fight is part of what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so what I, you know, what I try to do there is not tell actors what to want, but just to be a little bit more self-reflective on this is the situation you're in. You need to think about what are your goals and the consequences, and then choose the best path given that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for a great panel. We really appreciate all of our presenters, um, Professor Eric Potashnik, mm -hmm. Professor Andrea Campbell, Professor David Mayhew, and Professor Jim Marone. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And there are books outside. And, and if you're nice, Eric will sign them. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you've seen my handwriting.